Um, hi, everyone, and uh, thank you, Kirsty, for the lovely introduction. Um, when Kirsty first asked me to, to talk to you all about Crossmark, I was, I was a bit, well, we've been doing it for so long now. It's so straightforward. Um, I couldn't quite believe that not all Crossref publishers were doing it. Um, so apologies if I'm preaching to the converted, and if you're not yet depositing Crossmark, uh, hopefully this will help you see that it's really straightforward. Um, also, apologies for the slightly convoluted title. I was trying to think of something witty, and um, I don't think that translated. But uh, we've definitely had the journey through time, anyway. Oops. Okay. Oops. I've gone too far already. I've got the arrows now. Here we go. Um, so, as Kirsty said, we kind of started about five years ago, actually, the pilot group was formed in 2010. Um, and as Kirsty also said, we were on it. Um, we decided to just run a trial um, on one of our journals, which is uh, Proceedings of the Royal Society B. Um, and we also decided just to put that on the HTML versions of the articles uh, for all articles in 2011. Um, this went live in November 2011 um, with just using the status tab. Um, we decided against using kind of the second uh, record tab that you can also have in Crossmark. That was an optional extra um, that we decided we'd, you know, we'd get the basics right before we um, dive, uh, what's the word, <laughs> uh, digressed uh, slightly into the more exciting but uh, slightly less core stuff. Um, okay, so what did we do? Um, we had to do core, three core things. Um, it's pretty much the same now as it was then. Um, the first was to make sure that we were able to deposit Crossmark metadata. At the time, um, as part of the pilot, it was a, a separate process to deposit that metadata. Now it's part of, um, of the Crossref deposits that, that we make every time we publish an article. It's in the same core set of data. I have um, put a screenshot there of, of what the Crossmark metadata looks like. It's not intended to scare anyone off. It's, it's just kind of an illustration. Uh, you can Basically, you can find everything you need about depositing the, the metadata on the Crossref deposit schema. But if you have a third party to deposit the metadata, as we did, um, it kind of took the pain out of the process, if you like. Um, we just gave it to somebody else. The other two elements um, that we had to consider were to add the Crossmark metadata and the logo on our HTML versions of our articles and add the cross met Crossmark metadata and the logo to the PDF content as well, which came later once, um, once we proved the pilot was successful. Um, so this is just a couple of screenshots of what the Crossmark looked like in the early days. Um, so yes, yeah, so this, this was kind of a decision that we took fairly early on to where to put the Crossmark so that it was it was pretty obvious. We could so kind of encourage um, researchers to click on it. it it's still in a, in a very similar position today, and it's something that, because we've been doing it for a long time now, we always kind of consider what the placement of the cross mark whenever we do a redesign. It, it's pretty much integral to our articles now. Um, I'm sorry, I'm just going back to uh, the cross mark metadata page for a second. I should probably point out when I'm talking about. Um, the fact that our third party has deposited the metadata for us. Um, I'm talking about our platform hosts. Uh, that's Highwire Press. Um, so they were actually also part of the platform group um, and were able to help us formulate the metadata and deposit it for us. So kind of adding another step to the timeline as we move on. Um, then we decided to add the cross mark to PDFs once we found that the, uh, the HTML articles were working well. Um, and when I say working well, I mean that the, the data behind them was accurate and it was being deposited promptly. Um, so the PDFs, was, it, we took a slightly different approach from the PDFs. We asked our typesetting vendors to create the XML that sits behind the PDFs. Um, what that actually meant was uh, our production, it kind of added an extra uh, QA step for our production team. Um, so they had to check the, the XML on the PDFs and then the, um, the HTML version to make sure everything matched up. 
sometimes that's a little bit of a, a juggling act if we've got an article that's running very late and we're not quite sure what day it's going to be published on. Um, but overall, it, it's a process that works really well for us. Um, it, it probably varies from publisher to publisher how you decide to, to implement that. Um, and the other thing we did at the same sort of time, actually, was as well as um, having it on our leading journal, Proceedings B, we also decided to apply it to, uh, to all the other journals in our suite. So that's another nine journals. Um, what did we do then? Um, wow, we sat back and, and waited to see what would happen, actually. Um, and we're slightly surprised by the results. Um, so this, this graph kind of shows uh, the number of uh, clicks on Crossmark uh, logos. Um, we're starting in January 2012 and, and kind of going up to July this year. Um, over that time, our deposits remained pretty steady. They, uh, we were kind of depositing between 150 and 200 um, article uh, Crossmark metadata a month. Um, and the, um, what's quite interesting about this graph is that the, the graph for all publishers over the same time period looks really, really different. I haven't included it here, um, but I, I can show you that data if you like. Um, it's, it's freely available on the Crossmark app online, which um, I haven't got a link to, but we can share that. Um, all pub the all publishers graph, basically, the, the blue line, the, the from PDF click-throughs, is way, 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 way higher than the HTML. Um, so we're very much an anomaly in the fact that we have this huge spike in 2014 where our HTML just, just jumps. Um, so that, that was quite an interesting uh, result for us. Um, we have some theories as to why that is. Um, basically, it all comes down to the user journey, we think. Um, we, we rolled out a new re redesign in 2014. Um, there could be, it could not be the redesign, but the fact that actually um, our usage of HTML articles went up at um, a fairly similar rate um, in the same time period strongly suggests that, that it was down to the redesign. Um, the new redesign was a lot less cluttered. Um, if you remember the old screenshot a, f a few slides back, lots and lots and lots of links for users to click on. This time, it's very much paired back, which means that the, out of the few links that are left, the cross mark is, is one of the leading ones. Um, the user journey as well, actually, is something that we changed radically, um, which is why we think this is, the, is the kind of key reason um, that the usage jumped um, for both cross mark and, and the article views themselves. Um, Basically, we made the HTML version the main landing page for the article. So any links from the talks, DOI resolvers, all go to this page, whether or not an, art, uh, an author, a reader, has access to the page. Um, and then they're presented with a login form if they don't have access, which meant that regardless of the user, everybody could see the cross mark. Um, so that really changed the user journey and meant a lot more people coming to this page. Um, probably helped that we also started a, an advertising campaign, at, a marketing campaign at the same time to, uh, to mark the 350th anniversary of philosophical transactions. I mean, marketing never hurts, right? Um, just a couple of lessons then that, that we learned out of all of this. Uh, you're only as good as, as your supplier is kind of the key take home message. We're very lucky that we have a, a really excellent typesetting supplier. Um, and that high were also part of the pilot, which meant um, that we could kind of go through some of the challenges together. Of course, it does mean that we have to rely on our third party to make sure that the, uh, the metadata is correct um, and that you know, they're on board with any developments that we want to make. Um, we found along the way that we made a couple of changes to our processes. Um, which had a, an effect on the deposits. Um, the redesign was kind of one that was unexpected. Another was um, we, when we launched New Journal last year, we found that um, although we'd kind of briefed all the suppliers um, about the New Journal and the cross-ref deposits, we actually found that although cross-ref deposits were being made, the cross-mark data was being missed out. Let's say cross-ref and cross-mark by this point are all kind of 
together in the same deposit. Um, so luckily we picked up on that pretty quickly, but uh, I guess that old uh, project management adage of never assume, always check, always applies. Um, we actually also moved to a continuous publication workflow in November 2012, which was actually was completely unrelated to uh, the Crossmark project, but we found that actually they were really happy, happy bedfellows. Um, I think one of the, the questions that Kirsty might get a little bored of answering it, is why, why doesn't Crossmark work on PAP article versions? Um, why, why can't it track the same version? Of the, of the same paper as it's updated, and the answer is, you know, Crossmark, Crossmark is built to um, to track the different DOIs and the relationships between them. So, with a continuous publication workflow, the articles that we were publishing online um, were published online in their final version straight into an issue, which meant that any updates were not versions; they were published as a correction or you know, as a, as a retraction or whatever the case may be, which meant that there was always that relationship between two different DOIs rather than versioning the same DOI. So we find that Crossmark works really well with that workflow. Um, and then kind of finally to, to wrap up, really, I feel like I've whistled through this really quickly, but have we take any questions at the end? Um, just what's coming next? Um, we, we kind of talked about that optional record tab a little earlier on. Um, so we're going to be implementing that actually hopefully in the next couple of weeks um, and that's going to initially hold the funding information um, of each article and in the longer term we actually hope that we'll also be able to include information about the peer review process, um, data accessibility, we have a data accessibility section talking about where the data is available, so including that kind of data as well. Um, something else that uh, we're hoping will be coming soon is, uh, is something called Threaded Publications with Crossmark. Um, we're, um, we're hopefully going to be launching a new uh, article category on one of our journals called Registered Reports, um, whereby the authors will be kind of registering their intention for a study before they actually carry, the, carry out the study, um, and then linking that to, uh, to the results of the study later on when that's published. And we're hoping that this kind of idea of threaded publications through Crossmark and linking together a series of papers will help us to do that. Um, I think we've kind of touched a couple of times today, at least in the workshops that I was in, about uh, reporting f um, deposits, particularly when the publisher is not per the person making the deposits when you're relying on a third party. So that's something that we're kind of in discussions with Highwire about at the moment to kind of to ensure that we have sturdy reporting so that we're aware of when things are missed or when things fail um, in, in a realistic timeline rather than having to, to rely on a vigilant production editor or a reader to, to notice. Um, and then finally, I think something else we touched on this morning in the workshops that I was in, we're talking about um, backfile deposits. Um, our archive goes back 350 years. It's, it's quite a large backfile. Um, and, and we kind of support the idea that the, the retractions and the links between papers should be available um, where possible for, for readers to discover um, and kind of take the pain out of hunting for retractions and, and making sure that your research, that your citing is up to date. So, so we're kind of looking at our back files and seeing if uh, if we can deposit those. Might take a little while to get to get make sure the metadata is correct, but uh, that's what we're hoping to do in the future. So, as I said, that was a, a really, really whistle-stop tour. If, um, apologies if I've assumed more about your knowledge of Crossref than is the case, but I'm happy to take any questions.